Hi, good morning, California, and uh, good afternoon and good evening, Europe and Asia. Uh, it's, uh, this is Yi Chui. I'm a faculty co-director of Storage X in initiative at Stanford and also the director of Preco Institute for Energy. Uh, it's very exciting uh, to have our Storage X uh, symposium again. Uh, today is a, a very, very interesting topic for people, people working on energy storage. That's on wireless charging. Uh, we will have our own uh, Xianghui Fan uh, and uh, Professor uh, Reagan uh, to uh, give you introduction you know, on this topic. I believe this is a very interesting to everybody uh, working on batteries, working on other form of energy storage. Today, uh, to host these two speakers, uh, let me introduce my colleague, Professor Simona, uh, honorary to everybody. Uh, Simona is a young star faculty here. I'm glad to have her as a, a colleague. Uh, she received her PhD from University of Rome. And uh, he spent his post, she spent her postdoc at Ohio State University and, and then joining uh, Clemson University. Uh, since 2017, we were able to uh, recruit her to join Stanford University in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering. And she's an expert in the control and the battery management. I, I'm glad in the past number of years, I've been learning so much from Simona. Uh, with this introduction, Simona, I'm glad to have you to uh, host uh, the two speakers. Thank you so much, E. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind and generous introduction. Um, so good morning, everyone from Stanford University. And, uh, and today we kick off the uh, Storage X Symposium uh, for the summer quarter. Um, and uh, I'm very, very honored and happy to co-host this event today with uh, Professor Tsui. And, and we are extremely happy today to have two outstanding academic colleagues um, join us to talk about wireless charging. This is a very important topic, an exceptional important topic today. Um, for transportation and beyond that. And we are very happy to be hearing from the two uh, of the world's experts in the topic. Our speakers, as he has mentioned, are Professor Shanwei Fan from Stanford University and Professor Regan Zane from Utah State University. Um, let me introduce uh, Professor Fan a little bit in detail. He's uh, gonna be our first speaker. Uh, professor Fan is a professor in electrical engineering here at Stanford and is the director of the Edward Jensen Laboratory. He received his PhD uh, in 1997 in theoretical condensed matter physics from MIT. And uh, his research interests are in the general area of nanophotonics. Um, he has published a huge amount of papers, 600 papers and uh, uh, probably more than that at this, as of today. And uh, he has given more than 380 invalid talks. Um, among a long list of awards that uh, um, you can read uh, from his website, I decided to, I decided to pick three, uh, which deem probably the most important ones. Um, he got awarded the NSF Career Award, the David and Lucille Packard Fellowship Award, and uh, uh, the National Academy of Sciences Award for Initiative Research. Uh, Shannon, we are very pleased to have you here and uh, we look forward to your talk. Well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Simona, uh, for the uh, a very kind introduction and, uh, uh, and also uh, to E for organizing this, uh, to initiating this. So um, I'd like to talk a bit about our recent work in uh, electromagnetic and photonic concepts uh, for power transfer. So um, my group actually specialized in uh, electromagnetics and photonics. So uh, we seek to design structures to control electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic waves. And this is of central importance uh, for power transfer 
uh, because uh, almost all form of power transfer is carried out <clears throat> using electromagnetic fields. And here I actually give two examples. Uh, the power of the sun comes to us wirelessly uh, through the use of uh, electromagnetic wave at very high frequency of a few hundred terahertz. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, the way we usually get electricity, uh, those comes to us uh, through a wire, but uh, at a low frequency of about 50 Hertz, this again is a form of electromagnetic wave. Even though the frequencies of the wave are very different and therefore the detail device configuration look very different. The underlying physics of these are governed by the same set of fundamental equations. Those are the Maxwell equations. And therefore there's tremendous amount of cross fertilization uh, from one end of the spectrum, which is photonics to the other end of the spectrum. That's the usual electromagnetics and electronics. So uh, with that as a background, I like to talk about uh, two set of recent works. Uh, the first one is at lower frequency. We're going to talk about megahertz frequency, and we'll talk about some of our attempt uh, to improve the robustness of dynamic wireless transfer. Then in the remaining part of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something maybe slightly different from the focus of this symposium, but I think it's also quite important in energy technology, and that is the possibility of doing photonic voltage transformer. So let me start with the first part on dynamic wireless power transfer. Uh, first, let me give you a brief introduction about wireless power transfer itself. So uh, wireless power transfer in fact has a very long history and has a, a wide variety of forms. As one form of wireless transfer, one can directly send an electromagnetic wave from a transmitter, transmitter to a receiver. Uh, this in fact is how the power, for example, come to us from the sun. So it actually can go very, very long distance. Uh, the drawback of this, however, is that it require line of sight. Uh, obviously, if you block the line of sight between the transmitter and receiver, in this case, the electromagnetic wave cannot go from one point to the other. In the near field, uh, it is actually possible to do wireless power transfer without a line of sight. And uh, one common form of the wireless power transfer is the inductive transfer. In this case, one use two coils, each of them generate magnetic field when there's current. And the magnetic field of one of the coil can be seen by the other coil and that results in power transfer. In the simplest form, one simply use two inductors or these two coils, and this has been uh, very widely used, for example, in our electrical uh, toothbrush. However, uh, in doing so, the transfer distance is fairly limited. This is on the distance, perhaps on the order of a few millimeter. As a significant improvement of the inductive transfer scheme, one can enhance the capability by coupling each of the inductor to a capacitor to form a LC circuit and therefore forming a resonator on both sides. In doing so, uh, the transfer distance between the two inductor can be significantly improved. Uh, this idea, uh, as in many of the ideas in wireless power transfer has a long history. This idea dates back to uh, Tesla, uh, the inventor. And, uh, uh, but in uh, recent years, there's a resurgence of interest in this particular transfer scheme, uh, in part due to this very well-known experiment carried out at MIT in 2007. What they show experimentally uh, is very nicely summarized in this picture is that you can transfer power on the order of tens of watts through a distance of a few meter. And uh, uh, while the humans here, these are the uh, researchers who did the experiment, 
are blocking the line of sight between the two coils. So uh, this work has generated a fairly substantial interest and has been commercialized. As you can see, uh, the efficiency generally is quite good on the order of maybe about a meter scale, and then it gradually falls down as the uh, uh, distance increases. And uh, even though uh, there is substantial commercial activity around this technology, and in fact has been commercialized for stationary uh, charging of electric vehicles, uh, it is in fact difficult to use the scheme directly for dynamic wireless power charging uh, due to a fundamental constraint about these schemes. So to illustrate the scheme, uh, it's useful to go deeper into some of the analysis. So uh, imagine that you have these two uh, resonator coupled together you can describe them in terms of a couple more theory formalism. And the prediction of this is that you can compute the transfer efficiency as a function of frequency. Since these are resonators, you expect that the transfer efficiency will exhibit peaks. And these correspond to the eigenmodes of the couple resonator system. When the distance is short, these peak will split and at the height of the peak, at the center frequency of the resonance, you get 100% transmission. As you move the distance, the peak shifts because the coupling between the resonator changes, but there's always a frequency where there's 100% transfer efficiency. If the distance goes too far, the coupling constant is sufficiently weak one got out of this so-called strong coupling regime and the efficiency start to decrease. So uh, the, therefore, if you in the setup allow the efficiency to vary as the transfer distance vary, then you got this very nice efficiency curve where the efficiency is flat over a uh, substantial distance and then it drops when it's far away. And this is what they experimentally do. When they change the transfer distance in each of those distances, they readjust the circuit to get a high efficiency. On the other hand, uh, this require you for every distance to readjust the circuit. And if you don't do that, then uh, suppose, for example, you fix the transfer efficient transfer frequency, operating frequency at a single frequency, for example, then you get an efficiency curve that instead look like this, where you only have a peak at a particular transfer distance, and the transfer efficiency actually goes down, deviate from the peak, either as you go longer or shorter in the transfer distance. So uh, therefore, this scheme has substantial dependency on the operating condition, for example, the transfer distance uh, uh, between the uh, transmitter and the receiver. For stationary charging, uh, it's not too hard to imagine that you would design a transfer circuit, a control circuit that will allow you to lock the system into the high efficiency point because the condition doesn't vary much. On the other hand, if you think about dynamic charging, for example, uh, if you want to charge an electric car while the car is moving, then the condition for the transfer is continuously varying and it become a substantial challenge to come up with the right control to be able to maintain high efficiency power transfer. So, uh, to overcome this difficulty, uh, a few years ago, we have reintroduced this idea of parity time symmetric circuit in order to achieve robust wireless power transfer. So uh, the key modification here is instead of driving two passive resonators with a, uh, with a fixed frequency RF frequency source, what we do is to remove the source, but instead place one of the 
uh, place an amplifier inside one of the resonator. Uh, in this case, we would be directly providing DC power into the amplifier. And yet this is going to drive a wireless power transfer at a frequency of a few megahertz. So uh, the physics of this uh, comes from recent development uh, in both photonics and fundamental physics, such as quantum mechanics, about the concept of parity time symmetry. A resonator system that has gain and loss like this uh, exhibit what's called parity time symmetry because the system is invariant if you perform a mirror operator while in the meantime flip the sign of gain and loss. So the mirror corresponds to parity and the flipping of gain and loss corresponds to what's called the time reversal operation. And the important physics of this is that in this couple resonator system, if you look at the eigenfrequency of the system, in the strong coupling regime, when the distance is small, you have two eigenfrequencies that are continuously oscillating, and therefore there's no imaginary part. But if it's too far off, then the real part of the eigenfrequency coalesce, and the imaginary part, which tell you gain and loss, now bifurcate. Uh, this concept has generated, this kind of physics has generated very substantial interest in the photonics community for manipulating uh, the property of light. What we do is to borrow this concept to think about wireless power transfer. And in particular, what we do, uh, different from the usual linear parity time system, uh, we put in a nonlinear gain, saturable gain, inside the resonator, one of the resonator. In doing so, instead of talking about the eigenfrequency, we would talk about the oscillation frequency since the system is essentially an oscillator. And since I come from optics, this is directly analogous to a laser and you can think of it as a lasing frequency for a few of those uh, in the audience that has an optics background. So when the distance is small, the oscillation frequency trace the eigenfrequency and therefore is going to vary as a function of distance. And when the distance is large, they get locked because the two resonators are decoupled. Now, importantly, in this case, the system chooses its own oscillation frequency. As you vary the distance between the resonators, the electromagnetic field that's generated inside the resonator system has its own oscillation frequency dictated by the balance between the gain and loss. Now, if you remember what we have talked about, uh, about stationary system, this frequency, which is very close to the eigenfrequency of the passive system, is exactly the optimum frequency for efficient power transfer. So remarkably, in this system, by putting an amplifier inside the one of the resonator, the system would be able to choose its own frequency that happened to be optimum for efficient wireless power transfer. And therefore you can build a circuit where the transfer is always highly efficient over a range of distances without any need of a control circuit. So uh, theoretically, if you have the conventional scheme without any tuning circuit, as I mentioned, you will get a peak in the transfer efficiency as a function of distance. Whereas in the case where you have the PT symmetric system, again, without any tuning circuit, you would be able to achieve a flat transfer efficiency that is high over the entire range of uh, transfer distances uh, where the system stay in the strong coupling regime. So uh, here is our uh, experimental setup that aim to demonstrate uh, this concept. So uh, in the experimental setup, we have a uh, inductor, which are these copper uh, plates, and they are designed to minimize uh, 
absorb, uh, minimize a conductive loss, and therefore we use this very wide copper plate. And the white region, here, the white uh, object here, right underneath the inductor is the capacitor. So we have the uh, inductor capacitive pair to form a resonator. And uh, so we have the uh, source resonator and the receiver resonator uh, that are separate by a distance on the order of a meter or so. And uh, on the receiver side, for visualization purposes, we place a light emitting diode uh, uh, to be driven by the receiver resonator uh, so that, and we adjust the circuit so that when there is efficient transfer, the LED is going to light up. But if there isn't, then the LED is going to turn on. So turn off, excuse me, so that we have a direct way to visualize the efficiency of the power transfer. On the source side, uh, this is driven by uh, external power source in two different ways. We're going to do that in a conventional way where we drive it by a inductive coupling uh, using an RF frequency source or we're going to remove the RF frequency source, but put the amplifier directly into the, uh, the source circuit. And we're going to compare the performance of these two systems. So uh, just as a reminder, for the conventional scheme, we will have a transfer efficiency as a function of distance that look like the dash curve here. So therefore, uh, we expect the LED to light up only at a high efficiency point at a particular distance. And as we deviate from this distance on both sides, on the left and on the right, the, uh, you expect that the efficiency uh, to go down and therefore the, the LED to turn off. So we expect to see the LED lights up only at one particular distance. So here's a movie of the experiment. So this is Sid who is doing the experiment and he's pushing it apart. And as you can see, the LED lights up only at one particular distance and then slowly get dim. He's gonna push it back. Again, you see the LED light up only at one distance. And then importantly, it turns off even while you are reducing the transfer distance. So I think this is illustration of the issue associated with the conventional scheme. In the absence of the external tuning circuit, you would not have robustness. The transfer efficiency vary very drastically as a function of the transfer distance. Now in our scheme, theoretically, the transfer efficiency is indicated by the blue curve here. And one expect to see that the efficiency stays high over a wide range of transfer distances. So in our experiment, we expect to see that while the receiver coil move, as long as it stay within a particular distance range, the LED will remain lighted. And again, uh, this is Sid doing his experiment. You can see that the LED lights up immediately at the short distance regime, and it stays lighted over a range of distance until you go too far away. And you can see the same behavior as he's pushing back. As the receiver is moving, the transfer efficiency stays high. Uh, now the LED is simply a way to visualize the transfer process, but uh, we also directly measure the transfer efficiency and we also correlate the transfer efficiency with the measured oscillation frequency of the electromagnetic field inside the system. In the strong coupling regime of the uh, what's called the PT phase transition, the eigenfrequency should split. And this is exactly what we see where the transfer efficiency stay nearly constant. And in the weak coupling regime, the transfer efficiency start to drop 
and that correspond, correspond very well to the regime where the frequency, the oscillation frequency is independent of the distance. So the underlying physics of the kind of high efficiency robust transfer behavior that we see is directly related to the underlying parity time symmetry physics. This is the experiment that we performed, uh, published around 2017, uh, about four years ago. And uh, uh, in this initial experiment, the transfer efficiency measured as the power, the fraction of power we injected into the source rate resonator that's being accepted by the receiver resonator is very high. This is uh, fairly close to unity already, but the overall system efficiency is a product of the amplifier efficiency times the transfer efficiency. So ultimately what you care about is a transfer efficiency, is an overall system efficiency where you plug this thing into a DC power source or a low frequency power source and you ask how much of the power is received by the receiver. So in our initial experiment, the transfer, the system efficiency by itself actually is low because the amplifier that we use uh, was something called negative impedance amplifier. And if you look at the circuit of the amplifier itself, uh, there is intrinsic loss associated with this kind of negative impedance amplifier. In fact, uh, they are uh, in this particular configuration that I'm showing, uh, you can show that theoretically the efficiency of the amplifier itself uh, cannot go beyond 50%. And therefore, what we observe is something in the end, somewhere between 10 to 30% in our build circuit. Now, uh, it will be important to push this towards a system efficiency that's much higher. And it turned out that uh, one important ingredient is to replace the negative impedance amplifier with a switch mode amplifier. In this amplifier, the transistor will switch between a high conductance and a low conductance mode due to the voltage variation of on a gate driver. And in doing so with proper construction, the amplifier will always switch between these two modes and within these two modes, there are minimum power loss. Now I said proper design because this actually takes substantial amount of uh, theoretical and experimental work, uh, but I'm very uh, pleased and also quite proud. In fact, that Sid, uh, the student that you saw uh, in, the, uh, in the video uh, was able to do it after uh, several years of intense effort. And the end result uh, is that we are able to demonstrate uh, this kind of PT symmetric wireless power transfer with system efficiency over 90% as measured by the power injected, uh, the ratio between the power injected into the amplifier and the power that's actually consumed by the load on the, rest, on the receiver side. And again, this efficiency is robust to the variation of the transfer distance and robust to the uh, motion of the receiver. So um, this uh, conclude, I think the main part of my talk where I focus on uh, talking about dynamic wireless power transfer and a new scheme where we use parity time symmetric concept to improve its robustness. In the remaining maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, I like to switch gear and maybe deviate a little bit from the main theme of this symposium, but talk about a different opportunity that thinking about electromagnetics or photonics uh, can open up in the context of power transfer. And this is our recent work in thinking about a photonic voltage transformer. So, uh, as a background, I think we are all quite familiar with uh, voltage transformation from magnetic inductive coupling. And in this case, you send in a, a time varying a AC uh, a voltage variation, for example, what, you, what we use of a 50, 60 Hertz 
uh, a variation of the current and voltage. And uh, through magnetic coupling, uh, inductive coupling, it will raise the voltage or maybe decrease the voltage uh, to uh, a different value. And this has been very important for power distribution because it allow you to reduce the loss inside the transmission line and also uh, allow you to do basically voltage and impedance matching uh, between different parts of the circuits. So it's widely used uh, both in electric circuit, electrical circuit, in power circuit, as well as in electronic circuit. However, uh, this kind of setup works only for AC system, only when the current or the voltage is varying as a function of time. In both electronics and electrical circuit, there's also an interest to, to uh, perform these kind of voltage conversion for DC power. Uh, certainly, most of the modern electronic devices use DC power. And also there's substantial interest in thinking about DC power for higher power transfer as well. In this case, the inductive uh, transformer in fact cannot be used because the magnetic field, uh, the time you have to use a time varying magnetic field to generate a current on the receiver side. So the standard way to use, to create a voltage transformation in DC power instead is to use a switch mode converter. And in this case, one has a, again, an LC resonator, but one uh, have an additional thing, which is a switch, a time dependent switch, and then basically one switch on and off in here periodically to per charge and release the energy from the capacitor. And in doing so, uh, by controlling the duty ratio of the switch, one can control the voltage ratio, the output voltage uh, and the input voltage ratio. And uh, uh, this has been widely used but it has a number of difficulties. Uh, one of them is that in fact, it always required to use a magnetic inductor to build a resonator. And that's difficult to miniaturize and integrate uh, in the context of solid state devices. Uh, the input and output are directly connected on a circuit. So there's no input output versus, uh, oscillation. And uh, moreover, because there is a time dependent switch, this introduced periodic noise. And this kind of noise is in many cases, in fact, the primary source of electromagnetic interference. So uh, with this kind of uh, challenges in mind, we consider a completely different strategy for voltage transformation, we call it a photonic transformer. Uh, in this concept, we imagine a uh, energy transfer, a power transfer, again, through electromagnetic field, in this case, a high frequency by photon. So we will have a light emitting diode facing a sequence of photovoltaic cells connected in series. And uh, uh, in doing so, uh, one can take a, for example, around the volt applied on the light emitting diode and convert to a much higher voltage equal to the number of photovoltaic cell connecting in theory, roughly speaking, times the input, uh, input voltage. And some of the nice aspects about this is that in this case, the input and output circuit are completely isolated electronically and there is no switch noise because there's no time varying part on the electronic scale. And also both of these components are can be miniaturized and integrated and also can be scaled to relatively high power. So uh, here is an experimental demonstration. So uh, our setup uh, 
we use off the shell component. So these are the uh, silicon PV cell as the receiver connected in series. And then got a last night LED connected in parallel. And then we would put one on top of each other so that each got an arsenide LED is facing one of the PV cell to uh, really try to maximize the optical component between these two, sy two systems. And so uh, this is the uh, uh, experimentally built circuits assembled. Uh, this is when it's open, you can see the Ghana-Nasnite LED and you can see the photovoltaic cell. And then we close it together so that each of the LED is facing a PV cell. And uh, here is experimental measurement. We measure the uh, uh, voltage amplification ratio as a function of input voltage. And we can get to easily a voltage amplification of about 30 volt. Uh, by the way, the circuit that I show you has a hundred LED and PV cell pair. And the measure efficiency is a few percent. So now this idea, uh, in fact, uh, has been around, but uh, maybe let me also show you uh, the other measurement about the system, which is the noise measurement. So in comparison, we first use a spilled setup to measure the noise characteristic of a conventional switch mode converter that we uh, bought commercially. And uh, in this case, if you look at the output voltage as a function of time, uh, you could actually see fluctuations. And if you measure the electromagnetic field spectrum of the circuit, so what we do is we put a pickup antenna near the circuit itself and measure the uh, electromagnetic field power spectrum picked up by the antenna. In the spectrum, you see the usual noise of the room superimposed upon that are these peaks. And these peaks correspond to multiple harmonics of the switching uh, circuit. So uh, there's inherent noise associated with this uh, system. On the other hand, for our system, if you do the same measurement, the voltage is completely quiet. And the noise that you see is entirely the noise of the room. Uh, in fact, we turn the circuit on and off and you see the noise characteristic stays exactly the same. So in other words, within the experimental capability of measuring, uh, we cannot see any noise in the system. Now, as I mentioned, there has been, this idea has been thought about uh, for quite a while. Uh, in fact, people have thought about using transfer from laser to photovoltaic cell, but the laser is theoretically less power efficient. Uh, the LED to photovoltaic cell as a photonic voltage transformer has also been considered before, but if you look at it, the efficiency as we have measured is actually relatively low on the order of about a few percent. And the reason for this is that the optical transfer efficiency from the LED to the photovoltaic cell is in fact quite low in the assemble setup that we have. Now, uh, getting light out of LED has been a long-standing problem in the design of light emitting diode. And the standard difficulty is that the, at the interface between light emitting diode and air, light goes through total internal reflection so that most of the light is trapped inside the LED. On the other hand, for our problem, we're not trying to get the LED to go into air. We are trying to get it from the light emitting diode into the photovoltaic cell. Therefore, it is in fact possible to envision an integrated version where we placed a index match spacer between the light emitting diode as well as the photovoltaic cell to, uh, so that there is no light extraction problem. And using the same theoretical uh, formalism that we developed and validated against our own experiment, we then perform a design where we envision a completely integrated system with a gallium nitride LED 
couple to garden nitride photovoltaic cell separated by intrinsic aluminum garden nitride region. And using calculation that take into account all the non-radiated recombination of the system, we show that in this case, again, if you have a hundred photovoltaic cell set up, you will get a overall efficiency beyond 90% and a efficiency, uh, sorry, the overall power transfer ratio of more than 95 with efficiency approaching 90%. And this would be a performance that's very competitive against the standard switch mode oscillate, switch mode converter, but in a completely integrated system with electrical isolation and without any noise characteristic. And we think that this is actually a very interesting opportunity to thinking about using photonic concept in the context of power transfer. So with that, let me uh, briefly summarize uh, what I hope to convey is that the thinking of controlling electromagnetic wave and electromagnetic field, and especially many of the new physics that's being developed for that purpose, in fact, can be quite important in some of these applications in power electronics related to the transfer of power. And to end my talk, let me acknowledge in particular uh, Sid Asawawarari who have contributed significantly to both part of my work, the talk here, as well as Dr. Uh, Bo Zhao, who, who uh, also uh, did very nice work in this uh, photonic transformer. Uh, Dr. Bo Zhao is now a professor in University of Houston. So uh, with that, let me stop here and thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Shenmi. Thank you so, so much uh, for the great and systematic presentation, for teaching us about the fun fundamentals and physics of uh, um, power, power, uh, wireless power transfer and uh, uh, photonic transformer. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. So uh, during your, the first part of your talk, you talk about these uh, very fundamental ideas of uh, uh, self-optimally tuned system. So where the frequency is picked basically optimally by the system without any feedback control, without any control. And I think it's very fascinating. And uh, can you please elaborate a little bit more on this idea for uh, those of us like me who don't really work in your field, but uh, just to understand you know, a little bit more about it because it's very, very cool, it seems like. Yeah, uh, so uh, this is, uh, I, I guess you're referring uh, to the physics mechanism of the setup. Uh, uh, the setup is in fact building an oscillator. In other words, if you, uh, and this you see that in, uh, in the optical side, this would have been called a laser. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, you provide uh, a stationary power, uh, DC power to the circuit or uh, to the resonator. And uh, the resonator select a particular frequency uh, that has the lowest loss uh, and that particular mode get amplified. Uh, and therefore it oscillates right at that mode. So in doing so, uh, you don't select the frequency where the field oscillates, uh, rather the physics selected for you uh, because you build a resonator and they interact. So uh, in this case, uh, what we see, uh, what the physics that we use is precisely this kind, uh, is that uh, we think of these two resonators coupled together uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the physics is such that they, so the, it, the information goes into the resonance of the, uh, of the system and we simply provide the power to enable it to oscillate. Okay, thank you, thank you. So these ideas of wireless um, charging has been uh, initially proposed by Nikola Tesla, you know, right. almost 100 uh, years ago. So um, was the experiments that you described earlier, uh, the one done at MIT in 2007, that is really defined a breakthrough that made us think that wireless charging is effectively uh, a technology we can use today? Or can you please also elaborate on that? How we went from uh, going from a futuristic idea to a realistic implementable technology that we can use today? 
I think the MIT experiment is very interesting uh, in many ways because now you see that it actually work. Uh, it's a beautiful demonstration and it's a very uh, striking demonstration of the concept that uh, you can really do this. Uh, and also you can do it uh, essentially without line of sight with people blocking it at a scale that's important for many applications. So uh, I believe that uh, certainly the wireless power transfer concept has, uh, uh, has done a lot of work before then. And uh, uh, I believe that even the resonator uh, transfer concept uh, has been explored before, but uh, really demonstrated in such a very striking way uh, uh, generate tremendous amount of interest. And uh, uh, really, I think in many ways uh, is uh, one of the turning points uh, of the field. Great, thank you. Yi, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Well, Xianghui, beautiful talk as usual. Uh, both thank topics you. are very, very exciting. Um, the first one, uh, the uh, dynamic wireless transfer. Um, so what, how much power you could transfer? Maybe, I don't know, you calculate the power, the energy per unit area mm -hmm. of the two resonator. Maybe that's the right, yeah. that's the right uh, parameters to consider. Yeah. I'm now trying to couple this into the wireless transfer if I do that for electric car, right? Right. Um, uh, so how high power you can go to, would that be, the energy efficiency still maintained. Uh, yeah. Well, just want to see your comment about that. And the second one related to the question to this uh, in the audience, this one person asking, what well, let's look at the MIT experiment right there. The people yeah. standing be between the two, <laughs> one in right. the transform, the uh, receiver, the source and receiver. Electromagnetic wave coming in, and human body has a lot of this, uh, uh, right? it's, a, it's a salty yeah. solution it's going to absorb some of this energy. So what's, mm -hmm. what's the effect on, on human, if yeah. human is between these, these two objects, yeah. Yeah, maybe let me answer the second question first. I think in the MIT experiment, uh, their transfer power is on the order of a few tens of a watt because they are using incandescent light bulb. Uh, our usual experience, of course, you would not like that amount of electricity to go through your body usually. Uh, if you have a few tenths of a watt uh, light bulb, and you certainly don't want a wire that drives that to go through your body. Uh, in their experiment, and we certainly see that in our own experiment as well, uh, the point is that the field between the resonator are mostly magnetic field. And the human body uh, reacts far weaker to magnetic field than to electric field. So uh, you are right that there's a lot of carriers uh, in our body, uh, salty water, for example, or mostly a piece of salty water, right? So, uh, so if you have a car, if you have electric field, you're gonna drive current and that will be dissipation. But the coupling to magnetic field is far weaker. So that's maybe the first point to, make, uh, to address that. And we certainly see that in our own experiment as well. Our, uh, our latest experiment, the uh, Nature Electronic paper that we published last year, uh, has a power transfer level of about 10 watt. So uh, now uh, this is mostly uh, uh, in practice, mostly limited by the circuit available. Uh, for the MIT scheme, uh, people have used that for stationary uh, transfer to cars. Uh, stationary charging of electric vehicle uh, with, a, uh, with a power level on the order of a few kilowatts. Uh, that has been demonstrated and in fact, I believe has been commercialized. Uh, so uh, our power electronic requirement is in fact very similar to what they uh, need to use as well. So uh, we believe that with the right power electronic setup, uh, uh, the right kind of high power circuit, uh, we should be able to uh, scale this up uh, to maybe a similar power scale of, let's say, uh, somewhere on the order of a few kilowatt to uh, 10 kilowatt scale. And that's the kind of scale uh, that would be uh, relevant and important for uh, electric vehicle charging. Yeah, very, very exciting. Yeah, I think a few kilowatt to 10 kilowatt 
then uh, you, the battery pipe, if I'm looking into, I say 50 kilowatt hour. So uh, overnight charging is uh, absolutely possible, charging to full. So uh, that also open up opportunity for dynamic charging during driving as well, where you consume uh, several, really several kilowatt of energy during driving. So that's uh, mm -hmm. the power, that, that's very exciting. So second question, Xiang Hui, related to your, uh, this uh, new uh, photonic transformer, it's just fascinating to see an LED and a PV cell <laughs> to, uh, to, to do this with uh, potentially very high energy efficiency. So I want, want to understand a little bit more um, the energy efficiency calculation, right, uh, you show, that is from photon energy to the voltage efficiency. And, and then I'm thinking about it's a, it's a voltage as an input, uh, just clarification. And then I turn into photon and photon turn into voltage again. It, is your calculation is from voltage to voltage or is from voltage yes. to voltage? Okay. So that's- Yeah, that. the calculation is from electrical to electrical. Okay. Let okay. me give you a plausibility argument. Why the high efficiency? Uh, if you think a little bit about it, uh, state of the art garden nitride LED uh, is probably on the order of 80 something percent. This is photon to light. Yeah. For a photovoltaic cell, uh, because the LED output is essentially is very narrow banded. Yeah. So the efficiency is also very, very close to ideal. Yeah. So, uh, so the main difficulty wasn't in fact the efficiency of the LED and the PV cell, but rather find an efficient way to get a photon to go from one point to the other. Yeah, 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 that, that, that is correct. So that's, that's really cool. And, and the second question I Xiang Hui is now also come back to the, the amount of power yeah. uh, you can voltage in, voltage out, because right. voltage in needs to become photon, photon become a uh, voltage again. Right. Uh, then how much power you can drive, right? So uh, to, right. maybe this is still too early to see the limit, but I just want uh, to see the thoughts, yeah. yeah. Uh, possibly. So first of all, I think the power in this case, just a scale as area. Yeah. Right. Because the larger yeah. the area, the better the heat dissipation you can do, uh, you can drive the power up. Now, uh, therefore, it would be useful to just take a look at what's available and what we can reasonably assemble even at this stage, right? Uh, the uh, LED that we commercially easily can get uh, is on the order of watt to 10 watt scale. Yeah. So that's the, uh, the most naive thing you can do, can get you that kind of skill, uh, which is already quite uh, useful for electronic circuit kind of uh, power trans uh, voltage transformation. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think if one really want to think about uh, maybe a kilowatt skill, I think the scaling uh, probably should be able to get us there. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, very exciting. Back to you, Simona. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shenhui. And uh, um, I think there is much more to talk about uh, during the panel discussion. And uh, we can move to the second speaker, uh, Ragan Zain. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, Professor Zain, uh, who has been doing some, um, some exciting work on uh, wireless charging technology for electric vehicles for transportation. Um, Professor Zane is the um, uh, funding director of the Aspire NSF Research Center, and I'm sure he's going to talk about it. And Aspire is an acronym that stands for Advancing Sustainability Through Power Infrastructure for Roadway Electrification. And this is a big NSF uh, engineer center that involves nine universities, more than 65 faculty, and uh, many more students and uh, national labs. Um, he has published more than uh, 200 peer review papers and uh, uh, issued uh, 30 patents. And um, he has raised more than uh, 60 million in research funding to date. And uh, so Ragan, we are very um, pleased and happy to have you here today. And uh, please, you can start sharing your presentation and uh, the floor is yours. 
Um, you know, what a wonderful introduction, and I sure appreciate the invitation. Uh, this is a, a great audience, uh, I think a great opportunity to, to have this discussion around wireless charging, its implications for electric vehicles and uh, charging systems and infrastructure, uh, and, uh, and ultimately how this impacts the energy storage community. Uh, I've really appreciated listening into the, the first presentation, and, and Sean Huey has given a, a great highlight of the concepts for both static and dynamic uh, wireless charging. And with my presentation, let's take a step uh, up into the, the bigger picture uh, around uh, electrification in, for example, the, the United States. And of course, that can be expanded uh, worldwide um, and have a little bit more of discussion around what are the motivations, uh, what are the constraints and considerations, uh, and ultimately, uh, what are those power levels that we need to achieve? What are the technologies? What's the status of those technologies? And what's really happening? You know, what, what can we be excited about uh, coming um, and actually being uh, happening here in our lives and um, uh, being part of the uh, EV transformation in the coming, let's say, decade. All right, so that's the highlight of what I'll be covering. I am the center director for Aspire, and um, I'll give uh, some uh, some views towards uh, where energy storage fits in all of this, um, with an emphasis here on kind of what are those motivations for for uh, wireless charging in EVs. Let me start with just a brief highlight of who we are and and, and how we're uh, tied into this field. So Aspire is an NSF-funded engineering research center with uh, core funding from NSF and broad funding from multiple agencies and uh, industry partners. We're, we're headquartered here at Utah State University. Uh, we have core campuses, uh, partners here across the United States and in New Zealand. Uh, and we also have additional affiliated faculty uh, at multiple universities in the United States, uh, as well as collaborations with national labs, uh, industry partners. Um, as Simone had mentioned, we have um, over 50 faculty, uh, about 150 students uh, working in the program today. Uh, and I'll just give a brief highlight of a number of the industry partners. And the important aspect here is we have partners that, that are across the, the spectrum. This is a, a complex challenge uh, addressing how to really move forward with electrification uh, in the industries, uh, everything from the utility to automotive markets to, um, uh, to transportation systems and infrastructure. And it's going to take many uh, to have the right perspective to, to find the right solutions. And uh, this is what makes it quite interesting as well for each of us as researchers uh, and those involved in the field is we get to work across disciplines and work uh, in, in areas and, and consider constraints that you know, we never really imagined before. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun area. Uh, we have a broad committed team to, to making this happen. And uh, I'd be happy to make connections to those here in the audience, um, to various individuals across these industries and our, our research partners, as we find the, the specific area you're, you're most interested in. As a broad team, you know, we're committed to achieving you know, sustainability, uh, as well as equitable uh, solutions for transportation in the future. Uh, we believe this uh, impacts both the health um, uh, as well as prosperity and cost of, of moving people and goods, and quite importantly, the equity and access uh, to both transportation as well as health and, um, and economic growth. Uh, we believe that this, of course, is tied to uh, electrification, that uh, transportation has a big aspect uh, to, um, to address, and that um, widespread electrification will be very important to achieving these goals. And as I'll comment as we go through the presentation, we believe it's important to look not only at, for example, small light duty vehicles that are often on our minds, but across the full spectrum of vehicle classes and what I've broadly called here adoption groups, meaning everywhere from personally owned vehicles to fleets, uh, as well as from personally driven vehicles to a future of autonomous vehicles. All right, so considering that, let's imagine the, uh, what we're up against. So as we consider you know, broad, widespread uh, adoption of electrification, and we'll be getting here to you know, where does wireless charging fit? How, how will that help drive adoption and get us to kind of at scale solutions? Uh, but what is the challenge we're up against? Uh, so let's look at two of the, the primary markets that we're impacting, and that would be the power and electrical um, you know, generation and distribution market, uh, as well as transportation. So on the power, which I show here on the left-hand side, just indicating in this case with circles, various power generation, uh, utility scale generation across the United States uh, and similar uh, considerations in Europe and Asia and, and around the world. And on the right-hand side, I show just an example here of the United States, and I'm, I'm giving a, an image from uh, the Federal Highway Administration uh, looking at the truck volume uh, around the U.S. as just an example of uh, kind of the heartbeat of um, uh, the transportation systems and network. 
Um, so what are the sizes of these networks and, and what are the implications of, um, of electrification in this space? You know, it, it's instructive in, in some ways to look, for example, at the size of the market. So on the left-hand side, power generation, roughly a $400 billion market per year. Of course, that varies with, uh, with electricity prices, but is relatively stable. And on the right-hand side, we have the fueling uh, industry for diesel and gas in, um, in transportation. In the U.S., that's also roughly $400 billion. Now, that was uh, probably a number from a couple of years ago uh, with price, gas prices going up. Um, you know, this is probably closer to five to five fifty billion. Uh, also, we also look. We need to look at emissions. Um, you know, these two industries have been competing for the past years on on uh, who who has the um, the highest or lowest, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then we have similar constraints and implications for air quality uh, associated with um, with the localized emissions as well. But the uh, bottom line is these two industries are, are similarly sized. And so we start imagining transitioning, for example, the fueling industry from uh, liquid fuels to electric. We're really looking, for example, at taking the loading on the right, putting it over on the left. And of course, this doesn't add up one to one. The efficiencies are different. The generation is different. Uh, emission implications are different. But at order of magnitude, we're looking roughly, if you were to take 100% of our transportation network, move it to electric, we're looking at roughly doubling the size of the existing uh, generation requirements in the US. And when we look at both energy storage as well as overall implications for the utility, uh, another key consideration is what is the power demand? What I'm comparing here is really the, ultimately the energy demand uh, between these two. But depending on what the peak power loading is going to be when we go to electric, that depends entirely on how we charge these vehicles and when we charge them. That could also be a significantly higher uh, increase in the power loading on our utility. Now the big question is, will going to electric be a big disturbance that takes down the grid, or will going electric be a new significant resource for the grid that uh, is, is there as, a, as an aid uh, for, for growth? All right, so as we consider that, we should also consider, as I mentioned earlier, vehicle classes. Which vehicle classes are going to be important? Uh, where do we address uh, and focus our attention? And you know, our answer, we believe, is across the board. Um, to really address this challenge, we're going to have to be looking at all vehicle classes because of the significant portion of the pie they represent, both in terms of our economic um, implications for, a nation, for our nation, uh, as well as the emissions and energy use. And so here I highlight, for example, our, our smaller light duty sedans, you know, roughly a third, light, um, you know, large, uh, larger light duty, our best-selling you know, vehicle in the US, the Ford F-150, luckily uh, with an opportunity here going electric next year, uh, another third roughly. And then we also look at trucks, um, our shipping, freight, transportation, uh, again, this is how we move our goods around the nation. This too is uh, roughly a quarter uh, now of the energy. So these simply can't be ignored. And if you look at the lower portion of this pie, the combination of our trucks and our, you know, the freight and, and transit in the nation to, combined with the larger light duty vehicles, uh, this is over 50% of the pie. And uh, these vehicles require larger batteries uh, for, um, uh, for achieving long range and have significant implications uh, if, they, if we don't properly address their needs. So as we consider you know, scenarios, let's consider a scenario, let's just replace the gas tank with a battery. And uh, in our charging, essentially, you know, pumping at the gas station, essentially, let's replace it with uh, charging at the gas station or now a fueling station. So what does that scenario look like? Okay, we won't spend a lot of time here, but let me just highlight it for kind of a worst case scenario, which is those large vehicles, a quarter of the uh, energy and, and essentially emissions um, in, uh, in transportation. Uh, let's look at the semi-truck doing long haul routes. You know, we have the Tesla sem semi-truck coming out uh, hopefully sooner than later. Uh, multiple others now coming into that market. Very exciting. Uh, what are some of the challenges we're up against? Well, let's look, for example, at a 500 mile range semi. And keep in mind, when we say 500 mile range, much like when we say we have a 330 mile range Tesla or a 270 mile you know, Chevy Bolt, um, you know, that's kind of this optimal uh, quoted range. We're only going to use about 80% of that to stay safe with, you know, not overcharging the battery and, and typically not running in the bottom 10% uh, to give us a little bit of uh, buffer. Um, and then, of course, there's a variation in speed uh, up and downhill. We're going to have uh, heating loads in the winter and we're going to have air conditioning loads in the summer. So, you know, roughly speaking, a 500 mile range rated vehicle is probably more like a 300 something range a realistic vehicle. So in this scenario, what, uh, what are the implications? Well, I've given some relatively optimistic numbers here on costing. So let's say just the battery cost uh, and weight for that vehicle. We're looking at roughly $150,000 for the batteries and about 15,000 pounds 
with some optimistic considerations. You know, this is at $150 per kilowatt hour. Um, now, if you're thinking of, you know, cell numbers, maybe some are familiar in the audience, uh, you know, our targets are even below $100 per kilowatt hour, even towards, you know, 50, 60, and $70 uh, dollars per kilowatt hour, uh, our, our DOE targets today. Uh, but that's at the cell level. Here I'm talking about a pack level system rated for heavy duty uh, applications in trucks, cooling, battery management, um, you know, communications, a packaged battery pack system. Uh, today, uh, for something in this range, we're looking at uh, probably more like $500,000. So this 150K is, is, is an optimistic target, but certainly, certainly a target. Um, so this is a real challenge. The 15,000 pounds for such a battery, well, you know, loading on, the, on an interstate highway, a major road um, uh, with, with uh, significant reinforcement, you're looking at you know, maximum uh, loads of, uh, let's say, 80,000 pounds. This 50,000, 15,000 is a significant portion of that useful load. That's a challenge. Uh, how about charging the vehicle? Well, if we're going to be driving the vehicle, if we're looking for a charge, let's say, in, in 30 minutes or less, and we have existing projects uh, pursuing this today, we're looking at uh, well over a megawatt, uh, certainly over even two megawatts, Per vehicle for these trucks, um, and these numbers, of course, scale down for lighter trucks, uh, and then on down for uh, for light duty vehicles. But at scale, this is a real challenge. Uh, let's look at this more at uh, an aggregated uh, consideration. So, U.S. Uh, you know, batteries uh, required for all vehicles. Uh, let's say that we took 100 percent, and of course, it's a big big uh, target. You can scale that number however you like. Let's say 50 percent, 80 percent. Just multiply what I have here. Uh, in a 500 mile range. And if, if you think 300 mile range or 200 mile range is realistic, then uh, you can multiply that number. Uh, but just order of magnitude, what are we talking? Batteries alone for all of our vehicles to be converted electric with long range, we're looking in the many trillions of dollars. Here are the numbers that I've shown are roughly $7.8 trillion. And I don't know if 770 billion pounds means anything to any of us, but, uh, but giving an idea here of what, what is the total amount of you know, materials required, you know, manufacturing, you know, capacity that would be needed. So this would be the total battery uh, requirement to, to have all of our vehicles uh, converted. So with this in mind then, the big question for us, particularly on the energy storage side is, how long do these last? Uh, will these batteries uh, be 10 year life? In which case, you know, we can roughly divide all these numbers by 10 for a rough annual uh, cost uh, for the nation in maintaining these vehicles? You know, are they 20 mile, or excuse me, are they 20 year? Um, or is it uh, more like one year, two year, five years? So uh, that in, depends significantly on how these batteries are used and the, the battery solutions uh, realized. And so that's definitely something for this audience to, to be considering. Uh, and I'll put these numbers relative to our charging systems. And then finally, we look at the charging considerations. So where are we going to charge these vehicles? Uh, if it's going to be the typical gas stations, gas um, you know, fueling stations uh, becoming essentially you know, electric uh, sub, you know, system substations, one other big challenge is today, much of these are, are spread out and they're relatively small you know, station operators, um, in which case they have limited leverage with the utility. They have high upfront cost to add these chargers and utilization is going to be a big question mark for them. If they're going to have to put in, let's say one to $200,000 to, to put in a, a small set of chargers, uh, how long will it take for them to get that money back? All right, and then finally, I'll give one more perspective. Um, uh, let's take it down to the per mile perspective for operating vehicles. Um, and the, the kind of the driving scenario here, gas tank to, to battery replacement is an assumption that we're going to do fast charging. You know, in the, in the last presentation, we were looking at kind of where those power levels needed. Well, if we, if we charge overnight, um, um, you know, how many kilowatts will it be for a really small vehicle? How much would it be for a large vehicle? Um, well, as we looked at that pie in the previous chart, uh, you know, the small light duty vehicles is a portion of this, you know, how long do they have to charge? Um, well, the trouble is even for the small light duty sedans, only a fraction of those uh, vehicles uh, are with operators, owners that have a dedicated private charging where they can charge for 10 hours overnight, uh, dedicated charging at, at work. The vast majority of vehicles across the nation, and we have roughly one vehicle per person, or you know, at least uh, you know, 270 or so million vehicles in the US, uh, the vast majority of these vehicles are in urban areas where we don't have dedicated uh, parking, uh, private parking, and public charging is going to be uh, a necessity. Uh, so to really go to masses, even for the small light duty, odds are we're gonna to have to be looking at public infrastructure and probably we need to do faster charging so those vehicles can get out of the spot to make room for the next vehicle. And then certainly for fleets and, and autonomous vehicles and these large, uh, you know, these large heavy duty vehicles, they're gonna to have to charge fast. Uh, 
All right, so if we consider uh, the scenario of fast charging, uh, let's say we want to charge in this 30 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, you know, we're not, we're not even considering the two or three or five minutes that it typically takes us. What are the costs uh, to do so? And I'm, I'm throwing a lot in here. Um, let's look at the charging costs. Uh, this includes the infrastructure for uh, the utility, the cost of the utility, the cost of the charger. And these are actually fairly optimistic numbers. Uh, if it's in the fast charging scenario, this means you're paying more for the electricity, more for that high power uh, charging capability, higher than you would if you were just charging at low rates at home. These numbers could be in the you know, kind of 10 to 20 cents per mile for sedans and you know, 50 to a dollar and even higher uh, for semi-trucks. This is potentially a well above even uh, gas and diesel costs. Um, okay, if you're doing this only occasionally, you know, I drive my electric vehicles, I charge at home most of the time, I occasionally go on, uh, on long trips and I pay roughly the price of gas uh, when I'm long trips using superchargers, um, which is fine because it's a small percentage of my driving. But at scale, that's simply not gonna be the case. We need to find uh, better solutions. All right, and then the other components we don't often think about, what about the battery cost if we amortize that across the per mile cost of the vehicle? Um, now, how we use the battery is a big part of this implication. What are the costs for operating and using that battery? If we charge at higher rates, higher what we often call C rates uh, for the battery relative to the capacity of the battery, uh, this requires um, you know, more heating in the battery, it degrades the battery more quickly, and that means long, you know, shorter life. Uh, so this fast charging concept has a direct implication on what are the, what's the lifetime of you know, the $7.8 trillion investment. Taking it down to a per mile basis per vehicle, you know, we're in the five to 15 cents for sedans and 30 to, to even 80 cents. You know, these batteries could cost uh, you know, well, you know, at least on order uh, of the charging cost uh, or even more depending on that lifetime. So these will be critical considerations uh, for, for batteries. And then finally, the weight. Um, you know, this has more to do with the, the freight industry than our, our personal uh, vehicles, but uh, there is a lost revenue tied to the weight of those batteries, and that also needs to be quantified and considered. And then finally, the time it takes for, for charging, uh, that's an implication for the fleet operators and owners, uh, an implication for the truck drivers. It's also an implication for the land cost. Um, you know, where, where are we putting all these vehicles while they're charging? All right, so I'm giving a little bit of this uh, background to, to motivate what are the implications for wireless charging? Where does it fit in here? And I'll ultimately be pitching here, wireless charging is really opening doors for us that are well beyond uh, just the convenience of whether you had to plug in or not. It could really change the game across all these numbers. Let's see if I can convince you of that. All right, so let's consider various perspectives. Um, uh, what are the implications of EVs and the charging infrastructure of the, uh, moving to the future? And why do I want to put wireless charging in a broader perspective than just cutting the cord? Uh, all right, so from the environmental perspective, there's importance here of where are the emissions being generated? Localized emissions are a concern. I think we're all on board on how electric vehicles can impact localized emissions, um, including the um, uh, you know, equity aspect of, uh, of air, air quality in these high density areas around uh, you know, high density roadways. Uh, so localized uh, considerations are important, but so are the life cycle emissions. And this includes the manufacturing, the mining, the generation of these batteries, as well as the vehicles. All this needs to be taken into account. Uh, grid decarbonation is a, uh, decarbonization is a big question. And that ties right into my comment I made earlier of uh, what are the implications going to be on the grid? You know, high peak loads on the grid uh, that are unpredictable are a disturbance to the grid. These require spinning reserves and uh, resources that can be brought up very quickly on the grid. These are typically not renewable sources or require significant amounts of energy storage on the grid, which, you know, from an energy perspective, perhaps, uh, you know, it may sound positive, but that really drives cost up. Um, so we need to find a combination of solutions that allow the electric vehicles and their infrastructure to be a resource to the grid towards decarbonization, meaning we really need to look towards how do we support more utilization of renewable sources. Um, and all of these come into question on, on where the implications uh, for the battery, both on the vehicle and on the grid. And we believe that wireless charging can have a positive impact on both of those. All right, from the user's perspective, of course, they're looking for lower cost, not equal cost uh, or higher for moving people and goods. We're looking for a simple and easy experience. Uh, those that have EVs today, we know this is exciting, but that there's more that is needed to, to make this uh, suitable for, for mainstream. It really needs to be a seamless experience. Uh, finally, we're looking at uh, both personal, you know, shared fleet and, and, a, and a combination towards autonomous. We need solutions that are equitable. As I mentioned earlier, not all people have a private garage where they can park overnight and have dedicated access to a charger overnight. 
where are these uh, public charging solutions and what will they look like? Um, we really see an opportunity here where wireless charging can give us that, um, that availability of charging uh, in a broader perspective. From the vehicle side, to, uh, to reduce the cost and requirements on that vehicle, we've already hit some of the main points. Smaller battery really is an, a driving factor, not just for cost, but also for volume and for weight uh, on that uh, vehicle. Longer life is essential, and that's going to tie right into how we treat the battery. Uh, again, as you're probably seeing, preferably, we don't want high charging rates and, and large depths of discharge on that battery. We want to just baby this battery along. That's going to be where we get a good cost-effective uh, realization of energy storage on vehicles. Uh, shared infrastructure, so that we can share the cost of that system and infrastructure across classes and, and types. We need to look at, um, at, at all operating modes, parked, urban areas, highways, rural areas. All right, and then finally, from the grid's perspective, um, what are the, what's kind of the sum of all of the things that I've said here? To be a resource to the electric grid, what we are looking for are opportunities where the vehicles are more connected. If the vehicle is not connected to the grid, it's not a resource to the grid. You know, there's nothing we can do if you're not uh, if you're not capable of providing power or, or drawing power from the grid. You're not you're not on the grid. The more connected the vehicles are, the more likely we can leverage how and when we charge them uh, in, in a way that it's a resource to the grid. That drives to this next concept of flexibility, predictability, and management. Uh, you know, today the assumption is you pull up to the fueling station on demand, nobody knew you were coming, we have excess capacity because we, we, we need a, a room for all any vehicle to pull up uh, to the fueling station when needed. Uh, you pull up to the pump, you pull the, um, you pull the trigger and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're fueling your vehicle, um, in, uh, in this case at, at the equivalent of tens of megawatts um, or above uh, when you're using liquid fuel. Um, that is simply a scenario that, as I've, I've highlighted in the previous uh, slides, is not tractable on the grid. Uh, what we need is, uh, is flexibility and controllability and management. Uh, why on earth isn't it possible for the vast majority of vehicles out there where we have programmed in, we know where we're going, the vehicle in our Google Maps has already programmed this in, in our Tesla systems, it's already predicting and showing us which chargers to go to. Before we even get to the charger, Tesla vehicles are already you know, preheating, you know, preparing the battery. Fleets, you know, days in advance where they're headed. Why don't we show up to our fueling uh, locations with, um, with a prediction, with a guarantee of, of charging? And this uh, level of predicting, prediction and control is ultimately what's gonna be necessary um, to allow us to uh, levelize and, and manage the loading across the grid such that we can highly leverage renewable sources and, and reduce the, the cost of the infrastructure and ultimately the energy storage needs on that grid. All right, so with those pieces in mind, this is what we're after within the Aspire Center and, and why this drives us largely towards wireless solutions um, combined with a, a combination of, of wired capabilities in, uh, in the charging systems. We're looking at both a combination of wired and wireless, where wireless is really what gives us that opportunity, allows the vehicles to be connected more frequently, more continuously, uh, when you're uh, when you're shopping, when you're parked at work, when you're uh, even when you're operating your vehicle, when you're in your parking garage, all of these uh, scenarios, uh, that wireless charging gives you that greater opportunity. So we're looking at the combination of the, the technologies themselves, as well as the integration uh, together with the electric grid, operating across vehicle classes, and and quite importantly, this has to be done in perspective of the transportation, both the infrastructure, the roadways, pavements, parking structures how cities are even planned around, uh, around vehicles and where and when they charge, as well as the systems for transportation. How do we route and manage and operate vehicles? Can we do more intelligent co-optimization by looking at that low hanging fruit? Where do we have available capacity in the grid at this particular time during the day? Does that align with where we have transportation demand and needs? Can we align these two? The better we can align them and, and directly deliver power to loads, the lower the energy storage requirements are, you know, both to the vehicle and the grid. All right, so this is where Aspire uh, really puts its energy and emphasis. We see a great synergy with the future of more connected and autonomous vehicles. And the name of the game here is utilization. High utilization equals low cost charging. Uh, this is uh, ultimately our goal. And this is utilization of all aspects. Uh, predominantly, the things I've been talking about here are utilization of the generation, the wires, the transformers, the substations, the whole electric um, you know, utility that's, uh, that's feeding the vehicles. But we're also interested in, in utilization of the roads, the highways, uh, and even the vehicles. You know, today our vehicles spend 95% of the time parked, uh, the vast majority of them. 
as we look to the future, can we, can we flip that uh, equation and get higher utilization of all of this equipment and drive costs down for moving people and goods? All right, that's the perspective. And our pitch is wireless charging plays a central role in the level of flexibility. And I, and I pitch it this way so that, again, we see as we're looking at the technical solutions for wireless systems, we put it in this broader perspective. We're doing more than just cutting the cord. We're creating flexibility, manageability, uh, and connectivity with that grid. All right, within Aspire, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. I'm gonna move into our details of, of uh, the implications for, for the system, but I'll just highlight this requires multiple disciplines, multiple project areas, and that's, uh, that's how we're approaching the problem. That really drives us to the perspectives that I'm giving here today. So within Aspire, we've ultimately uh, combined our projects into a, a high level of five, uh, what we're calling umbrella projects, but core areas where we have disciplines from transportation and power and data, um, uh, as well as uh, consumer and adoption considerations uh, in fast charging concepts, pavement integrated wireless charging solutions that allow us to be connected um, more frequently, more continuously, where the vehicles are often operating. The bottom line here is we're looking to bring that charge to the vehicle. To what extent can we move away from the model of cars going to the fueling station? Can we bring the fueling station to the vehicle, essentially? I mean, that's where we have power. That's where we can best leverage uh, the existing capacity of our buildings and our infrastructure in the city. Let's consider this for our charging systems. And that really drives, brings us to that next uh, major project of smart and secure charge management. This has to be considered together with the uh, charging system. And then finally, how do we integrate these systems? The transportation, power, uh, user groups, uh, et cetera. And how do we develop both the market for this? What are the policies required? Uh, public-private partnerships. Um, we're looking at public roadways and combining them with, uh, with private uh, interests and entities. Can we turn our roadways into you know, profit centers uh, uh, where it's no longer kind of the bane of existence for, um, for taxes on roads, but uh, can these roads actually pay for themselves? So these, are, these are questions we're, we're addressing. Of course, from the academic side, we're, we're quite interested in the workforce needed. All right, for that perspective, we, we have many expertise. I'm just gonna skip that bottom section. Uh, to, to address the challenges. Uh, within the center, we have, uh, we have kind of two perspectives on systems level test beds to evaluate the capabilities. There were some questions earlier on power requirements and, and power needs and, and what, are, what, are the, what, are the, what are the implications? Can this be done? You know, would this drive adoption? So we're looking at this both from a modeled perspective and an operational perspective, as well as hardware systems and testing. So on the left-hand side, we're building a full-scale city and inner city simulator. Uh, not alone, of course. So you know, national lab partners have already made significant progress in this area. Uh, we're pulling in all that we can from, from any um, uh, resource to get what we're calling an expansive co-simulation platform. And this is ultimately to address those larger scale questions. If we improve efficiency 5%, what does that do for the, the implications for the overall system if we cut costs by 5%? If there's a new policy that changes user behavior, these are the types of things that we would like to simulate uh, at scale, meaning we'd like to show that if, if something were to happen in, in a certain narrow aspect of the system, how does that change the way a city operates uh, in, in, with respect to transportation and charging? On the right-hand side, we're also um, operating a hardware systems test bed. Here at USU, we have a quarter mile test track. We have electrified segments with uh, core components in the pavements that allow us to evaluate and vet different concepts for wireless charging. Um, you know, as, as Sean Huey has already emphasized, there's a lot of research around new solutions and techniques, uh, both with inductive and also mentioned capacitive, but, but that can all be vetted and evaluated and researched here, tested with vehicles, tested with the integration with the grid. We have solar power, we have on-site energy storage, we have on-site generation. So we're looking at kind of the combination. How should this work uh, in buildings and, and, and vehicles and, and systems operating together? And then finally, we're working with partners for pilots uh, in public environments, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Okay, so in these perspectives, let's look at static and dynamic. I'll briefly highlight uh, kind of where we're at with each of these, and then we'll conclude with a, a mention of, uh, of new research happening in the space. So static charging, um, this is an important component. Um, um, and I'll, I'll highlight this uh, here in a moment on kind of where does the charging need to occur. But there's still a significant portion of, um, of operating of our vehicles where we're going to be either parked, uh, we're, we're spending 95% of the time, as I mentioned now, uh, but even if we move towards better utilization of our vehicles, perhaps uh, semi-autonomous or autonomy may, may help drive us in that direction, uh, there's still a significant need for charging while we're either parked 
or we might even call this semi-dynamic, but, um, but you know, when we're in a city, running at very low speeds, approaching a stoplight, when, when we're in the queue for, uh, for getting um, an In-N-Out burger, but whatever the, the application is, static charging is, is clearly here to stay. Where is it? So inductive wireless chargers uh, for EVs, uh, it provides convenience, and most importantly, it provides that, that convenience and, and ability to have more frequent charging. Uh, every time you pull into a, 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 a parking opportunity or, um, or, or stop in a, in a queue, uh, these could be new opportunities for expanding the charge. How does this mean, what does this mean for the battery? It means your battery is getting charged more frequently. It's more like a hybrid vehicle than, uh, than a battery electric vehicle in this sense, meaning it's quite possible in an urban city environment where you might have multiple opportunities for the static charging that, um, and even semi-dynamic charging, you may actually be able to operate that battery closer to 50% with small increase and decrease. Uh, this means that uh, battery will be a very long life. All right, efficiencies today. Efficiency is really a question of cost. Um, the theory is here to go even well above 95%. Um, you know, and I shouldn't even say theory. We have the hardware systems to run very high efficiency. Uh, but of course, the higher the efficiency, uh, the more the more copper, the more um, uh, the more field uh, shaping and coupling and control. This this leads to cost. Uh, so in cost effective solutions, we're in the 85 to 93 percent range, uh, relatively easily. Commercial systems today. I'll give the examples over here on the right, both light duty and, uh, and even uh, medium to, to heavy duty uh, are out there commercially. Um, great fit for autonomy. You can you can check this link uh, for Hyundai and their vision of uh, autonomous vehicles that will go and park themselves and, and utilize stationary charging in a, in a parking structure. They've announced um, uh, the opportunity for wireless charging for the Genesis, uh, their, their flagship vehicle uh, from Hyundai coming out next year. Uh, BMW already had, a, had an option out. Uh, each of the OEMs are investigating this. That's all tied to the fact that there's now a standard in place. SAE's put in the 2954, J2954 standard. Uh, these are for three kilowatts to 22 kilowatts with inductive charging. Uh, this is happening. Uh, high power, I'm, I show here in the lower right, one of our partners, Wave, IPT. Uh, headquartered right here out of Utah, um, uh, now owned by uh, Audionomics, uh, has multiple demonstrations, uh, not demonstrations, multiple uh, systems in operation in California, uh, running up to 250 kilowatts, both for buses as well as the port, uh, port vehicles like forklifts, uh, and now they're looking at operations uh, with trucks. And we're investigating opportunities with them to, to look at even higher power levels. I'll just give a mention of two pilot projects. Sorry, sorry to be moving quick, but um, uh, just highlights of what's really happening out there. What is possible and, and not only possible, but actually being demonstrated. Uh, we have two research projects uh, that, are, that are both research and demo development and, and even demonstration uh, in operation now. Uh, one precedes the other. The 500 kilowatt is about a year and a half ahead of the one megawatt. Uh, but each of these are really happening. So at the Port of Los Angeles, this is a project led by WAVE uh, and partnered with Cummins, uh, our, our team here at USU, Schneider Electric for, for the uh, distribution systems. Uh, but this is in testing now. So we are testing that the core modules, uh, well over 100 kilowatt uh, in the labs today. Uh, this 500 kilowatt charger, uh, the wireless component is being built by WAVE and they've already tested uh, the major components. This is being deployed in the coming year. Uh, our megawatt charger, uh, this is possible. Uh, this is happening. Uh, we have a DOE project uh, led by Kenworth, again partnered with WAVE, uh, with uh, the utilities in each of the regions. We're looking at uh, hub and spoke operations around Seattle and then a, a regional haul route. Uh, Seattle to Portland is going to use one megawatt chargers on each end uh, during the required 30 minute stop for the truck driver. Again, these systems are in development. We're going to be seeing them deployed for demonstrations over the next year. Uh, exciting uh, things coming. All right, dynamic. Uh, this is also where we, we see kind of the game change. Uh, now, in addition to the multiple opportunities for charging while we're stopped, now the pitch is how about we actually charge the vehicles while they're, while they're in motion? And now this is necessary for vehicles that are going to be operating more continuously, more frequently, um, as well as um, running long, long haul. If we're going to run here for multiple hours, we don't have that static uh, opportunity the way we do with start and stop throughout the urban area. So is this uh, feasible? Is this possible? Well, the, the concept, of course, dynamic uh, charging of vehicles has been around uh, you know, for, for a long time. Uh, with conductive solutions, we have overhead um, you know, light rail um, uh, trolleys, uh, you know, these have been around for a long time. Now we see hybrid buses, you know, running with these systems. Uh, we know the advantages of delivering power more continuously to the vehicle. 
can this be done wirelessly? And of course, the answer, as we've seen in the previous presentation, is yes, and it's happening today. Um, all right, so what's the concept? Uh, we've already seen the basic scenario, but in a, in a, in a roadway environment, how would this be realized? Uh, here's a broad vision. We have you know, roadside equipment, uh, as was shown over here, number one, that would be the utility connection. We would envision that roadside connection being, let's say, once per mile, once per every couple of miles. Uh, uh, this allows us to uh, have some um, uh, ability to expand to, to large, uh, large scale. Uh, this doesn't require significant cost with multiple connections to utility. This allows shared infrastructure over, over many miles uh, of charging. Then we would have coils in the pavement. This is showing for inductive charging. I mentioned we're looking uh, at a wide, wide range of solutions, both inductive. Uh, we have partners at Cornell uh, University looking at capacitive charging technology, uh, as well as others throughout the nation and, and world looking at solutions. Each of them now looking at some of the challenges that were brought up in the previous presentation on dynamic charging. How is it that we can do this um, you know, cost effectively and maintain high efficiency uh, despite the challenges of coupling uh, while we have vehicles in motion? And uh, many solutions now are already uh, not only in, in development stage, but actually in demonstration stage that have already solved uh, scenarios for high coupling, even at highway speeds. Uh, for these vehicles operating down the road. And then finally, the receiver on the vehicle uh, picks up that energy. Um, as far as the vehicle is concerned, um, it would see a relatively continuous uh, pickup from the multiple coils. And this is a careful uh, combination of the design uh, of those um, magnetic structures, the coupling of the magnetic structure, um, and the control of the energizing of the unit. From the roadway side, individual units energize in sequence with the receiver components as they come over those chargers. Um, so each individual charger on the on the roadway would see pulses of power as the vehicle comes over. The vehicle sees nearly continuous power uh, as it's continuing over uh, the electrified segment. And the overall utility connection sees a relatively continuous power because, as I mentioned, we might have one to two miles um, energized from one uh, connection to the utility. That vehicle is on that mile for, uh, for, for some time period. Many vehicles now are on that mile. The only variation that the utility sees in power is the change in number of vehicles per mile throughout the day. And that's relatively predictable and can be relatively smooth. Uh, this is good for the grid. All right, so over here on the right-hand side, just highlighting what, what, what would dynamic charging bring? The key uh, emphasis is good for the battery. It's good for the grid. It's good for shared infrastructure across classes, light duty, medium duty, heavy duty, all using the same roadway. Uh, it's good for long life systems meaning that we're really pushing the cost of the, as well as the complexity from the vehicle where we have some of the most significant challenges, safety, power density, weight, um, cost, moving it to the infrastructure and the grid where we can have long life payment, pavements, long life um, you know, electronics at the grid level. Now we're looking at 20 plus year life systems as opposed to five to 10 year systems on a vehicle. And this can be done at scale instead of having individual operators you know, a mom pop shop um, you know, running their, their gas station, turning it into a fueling station. Certainly aspects of that are going to be happening. But if we do this at scale on roadways, we could have public-private partnerships with roadway owners and operators around the urban region that may be operating and owning uh, tens to even hundreds of miles of uh, roadway. They would now become one of the largest, if not the largest, loads to the utility in the region. They would have significant operating and buying power in, um, in bringing the cost down for electricity. All right, so that's, uh, that's a, a primary pitch for each of these. Another perspective, and uh, we'll be wrapping up here. Uh, as we look at um, uh, the battery implications, both for on vehicle and, uh, and on the grid, a way to, to consider this, I've already mentioned, if we can run relatively continuous charging, if 100% of the roadway were, were electrified, you don't actually even need a battery on the vehicle. Of course, that's not realistic. You know, that would be similar to a, to a to an current electric train. Um, but uh, what could be realistic, let's say we, we energize half of the roadway or a third of the roadway. Uh, these would be based, and we can even strategically select the sections we, we electrify, where perhaps we have the heaviest demand going up hills. Uh, when, when we're more likely to be accelerating. Uh, some of these regions might take the, the edge off of the energy requirements on vehicle. Uh, what the question now is, what's the ratio of the, 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 uh, the roadway that's electrified? If it's half, then we need to supply roughly twice the power that the vehicle takes when it's operating. A truck running at highway speeds might be 100, 150 kilowatts. Um, uh, if we are continuous, that's the draw on the grid per vehicle. If we did a half of the road, we're in the two to 300 kilowatt range. Even less if we're only range extending uh, the vehicles uh, on the road. For sedans, we'd be roughly you know, five to 10 times lower for those uh, power requirements. 
If we compare this to fast charging off road, uh, now a couple of changes. First, you need more land. We need a place to put all the vehicles. If we're uh, and the next big question around this is what percentage of time are you spending charging uh, when you're parked versus operating while you're driving? Uh, if we're willing to park for the same amount of time that we're driving, so we drive three hours, we're going to park three hours, drive three hours, park three hours. Well, first, we need enough land for roughly half of the vehicles that are operating to be parked somewhere charging. Uh, that's a, a challenge and a cost. Uh, and then second, the ratio of those two determines the the peak loading on the grid and the peak charging rate required on the vehicle. Uh, again, if it's one to one, uh, it's the same. So the instantaneous uh, requirement on the vehicle is the instantaneous requirement while you're charging. Three hours driving, 100 kilowatts for a truck, three hours um, charging, 100 kilowatts. You would maintain your state of charge. But that's, of course, not what we would do. We want to charge in 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Now we're getting into ratios of five to 10x or even higher. That's where we get up into the multiple megawatts of requirement on the vehicle. Uh, so this not only hurts the demand and requirements for the battery on the vehicle, now we have C rates that, uh, that could be you know, 2, 3 C, uh, 4 C, even higher, um, which implies uh, cost and, and aging on the battery. And we have high power peak demand on the grid, which implies cost on the grid. All right, so those are challenges we're looking to address with, uh, with wireless charging. Uh, lastly, I'll just highlight um, you know, the little video from, uh, from our lab. Uh, this is the test track at USU uh, showing an example of an electric bus where we're evaluating scenarios of networked control and charging, indicating now what this would look like, you know, charging systems in the roadway, let's say a couple hundred kilowatt uh, you know, receiving pads on the vehicle. Same concept with the reduced size pad could be on a light duty vehicle receiving a fraction of that power to, to hit the same demands for, for the light duty, uh, all with the same infrastructure. And of course, shared infrastructure is the key for, for equity. All right, I'm going to run out of time here. Uh, there's a lot more that, uh, that we could talk about. Uh, I do have some numbers and thoughts here around kind of which miles would we electrify? Uh, what are the implications uh, for, for costing? How does this compare to liquid fuels? We will just briefly highlight that here. Um, as we look at roadways, you know, again, again a significant portion of our uh, miles driven, which is here on the right-hand side, 58% of miles driven are in the cities. A lot of this could be handled with the static charging. Some of that may be plug-in at home. Some of that may be wireless uh, at home. Uh, but again, for those vehicles that don't have private garages and private parking in our bigger urban areas, this could be a, a significantly uh, a significant portion solved by static charging uh, and semi-dynamic, meaning low speed dynamic charging uh, in the urban area. Where do we really need the, the continuous uh, dynamic uh, charging? Well, a key uh, consideration are these you know, interstates. 2% of the paved roadways account for roughly 30% of miles driven. Getting from city to city, this is really how we are motivated to, to select one car versus another. Um, you know, we've seen um, uh, scenarios, you know, the Nissan Leaf when it first came out, you know, it should have covered a, a big portion of our driving, but it didn't because we want a vehicle that can not only drive in the city, but can also get from city to city. Dynamic charging could break that barrier and allow us to have smaller battery vehicles, cheap vehicles. Potentially, we could have $10,000, $15,000 vehicles uh, for the masses. Uh, without private charging re uh, infrastructure requirements, if we can guarantee that those same vehicles can drive from LA to New York um, and these interstate highways could get them there. Over here on the right hand side, I can repeat that image of, uh, of the interstate highway you know, system, specifically around the freight corridors. This is essentially a roadmap for how this could roll out and even who could pay for it. You know, let's start with the high density uh, trucking routes and uh, you know, they don't have a good solution. If we start there and then work our way towards um, you know, applying that same infrastructure for medium duty and then down into light duty as uh, adoption grows, this could really pay for the system. Finally, quick highlight on cost comparisons. Uh, kind of starting at the bottom of my list here, 400 to 600 billion, that's our fuel uh, costs for diesel and gas. And what percentage of those are going to get converted to electric? That gives us a rough idea of the numbers we're talking about uh, that could be uh, shifted to our infrastructure and our charging costs. If we go the full battery route, high, high range, um, all batteries, it's going to be too cost, it's going to be too expensive. Uh, I, sh I should, these numbers again are based on $150 a kilowatt hour uh, for systems. You know, even if that could be cut in half, which is almost unrealistic uh, for battery systems, not cells, uh, this is a large number. To electrify all the interstate highways in the ballpark of $30 billion. This is for two lanes in each direction um, for the entire interstate system. Uh, it's something to seriously consider.
All right. With that in mind, uh, let me just wrap up by mentioning that uh, these systems are happening. Uh, studies have been performed. We ran a study together with our partners at Purdue, Colorado State, and the infrastructure firm AECOM uh, in and around LA uh, and evaluated uh, kind of as the, how would this roll out? Well, you know, if we don't have all the interstates covered, um, you know, how do we get vehicles to convert? Uh, well, again, freight, fleet, operated vehicles or controlled routes, uh, maybe a good low-hanging fruit. And we evaluated um, examples, um, you know, such as the, the 710. Uh, we found that in infrastructure costs in this scenario over the lifetime of the system, starting with zero adoption at the day it's put in, over, let's say, a 30-year life of the system with high adoption occurring after about 15 to 20 years, and amortizing the costs uh, of that system over its full life, we found that the uh, the cost of that infrastructure could be covered with roughly 25% of the fuel savings going from diesel to electric. Uh, all right, uh, these things are happening out there. Uh, a partner, Electrion, has actually run a demonstration in Sweden uh, over uh, you know, roughly a mile, uh, over a kilometer uh, of electric roadway. And now the Swedish Transportation Authority, based on the evaluation of that system, has made the decision to build now a permanent road uh, running this electrification uh, for wireless charging, and they're also investigating overhead uh, powered lines for heavy duty. So these are, are really happening around the world. Here in the U.S. within Aspire, uh, there, there's over $30 million recently committed to multiple pilots in multiple states uh, that our partners are involved in. Very exciting time to see these things coming out, but now is the time to be uh, you know, pushing our ideas for improving both the wireless charging systems and in my view, retuning our energy storage, our battery systems to fit these scenarios. Uh, here at USU, we're looking at scenarios with pavement integrated concepts, with our civil engineering teams, our mechanical engineering teams, the electrical teams, our magnetic coupling uh, you know, scenarios to, to improve that coupling factor and efficiency uh, that uh, Sean Huey had, had, had mentioned. Um, uh, all, all of these things are, are being considered. We also have international partner, University of Auckland. I'll just highlight as we look at um, you know, the, the, the significant uh, implications that uh, now Itricity has pulled out from MIT uh, and a lot of the press and excitement that has come over the past 10 years from, from their experiments. I'll, I'll mention you know, our partners here in Auckland, they've been at this for over 30 years uh, and they've deployed systems in factories and infrastructure. They've deployed them um, uh, for, for light duty, medium duty, and now we're looking towards heavy duty systems. Um, and here's kind of the history and scenario of the companies that have uh, followed that technology. Um, brief highlight, these things are really happening. All right, our pitch, combination of static and dynamic wireless charging, uh, energy storage uh, on vehicle, low to moderate C rates, short range. This is what's gonna bring that cost down for the vehicle. Let's just baby that battery on vehicle and push the emphasis towards the grid. On grid, let's focus on scheduled managed charging so that uh, energy storage on grid isn't the first line of defense. I think that should be the second line of defense. Uh, then energy storage will be a critical next factor uh, to show how we can best improve the integration with renewable sources and bring down the overall cost of the system. If we go back to that long haul scenario, if we could bring that uh, truck down to let's say a 100 mile truck instead of a 500 mile truck, it's quite feasible. Now we're looking at somewhere in the range of 30K for the battery pack. Uh, and you know, maintenance operations, it's all simpler on that vehicle. 3,000 pound battery, very much uh, you know, in a feasible range. Let's say a 200 kilowatt continuous power from a 50% electrified roadway. Now we could be looking at charging costs uh, you know, roughly in the tens of cents uh, per mile. All right, and let's not forget, this is fun. <laughs> this is a great way to get people excited. We have programs with middle school students, high school students, uh, this is really a field that can get uh, people engaged and excited about sustainability and our environment and, uh, and really rethink, you know, who wants to be an engineer. Thanks for your time. Feel free to contact me. A uh, few highlights are given below. Uh, thank you so much, Regan. That was um, great. Thank, I mean, great uh, uh, overview of all the implications of wireless charging uh, um, can have on electrification and uh, transportation today. Um, he would you like to ask questions? Would like to kick off the panel discussion? Or... Yeah, I I would like to ask a questions. Uh, uh, Reagan, thank you for outstanding talk. Very exciting center you are running uh, over there. Um, you know, this remind me looking at what you are talking about. Um, uh, what's happening at Stanford right here in Pico Institute for Energy? Uh, we have a bits and watts in initiative. Uh, the EV fifty program. Um, 
we are, we are running uh, try to help enabling uh, fifty percent penetration of uh, electrical vehicles. Certainly, this ambition will go bigger at some point. We'll try to target nearly hundred percent, right? A lot of a lot of issues you, you talk about are uh, uh, very exciting to to us. Look forward to certainly offline discussion. Uh, uh, how Stanford and your and your center we could work together. So I have maybe I I start with uh, one question. Um, and uh, for the time consideration, Xiang Hui, if you uh, want to turn on your video, I think uh, it, it's a good time as well. This question is also relevant <laughs> to you. So. I'm here to learn, right? So looking at the wireless charging, uh, that means um, you will carry the inverter. Uh, let's say wireless charging on the car, you carry the inverter on the car, right? Because uh, you are going to do wireless, that's AC to wireless AC, and then do the inverter in the car. I'm trying to figure out if inverter in the car given certain power, uh, inverter carry some weight, so that's one consideration. How much weight you need to carry? Uh, I probably need to get educated a little bit, right? <laughs> Maybe more for you, Reagan. And the second one is once we go to high power, uh, the any energy eff inefficiency, the loss will become heat. Where does the heat will distribute it? Is uh, for the case of car, is on the more close to the car side or more, more close to the uh, source side or just somewhere in the air, right? Uh, so how do I think about the heat dissipation? Then going to the very high power, uh, certainly, you know, from AC to, inver to inverter become DC before you're going to the battery, this energy loss as well. I assume if I remember correct, that's 5% loss. And then uh, uh, wireless transfer, probably in the best case, you also have 5% loss. So I just want to get educated a little bit, Reagan, and also Xianghui from you as well, both of you, about the heat, uh, thinking about heat loss. Sure, I'll, I'll take a quick stab. And, and since we, we've all run a little bit over, uh, see if I can keep these short and give each of us time to answer. Weight, uh, weight on vehicle. You know, here the big question is the, the weight of the you know, receiving uh, system. You mentioned the inverter. It's, so we essentially have the rectifier. It does require you know, some of the matching network for the resonance and, and operation. So typically we're biasing this towards more simplicity on the components that are on vehicle to, to reduce that weight, but that has implications on coupling and efficiency. Um, so there are a number of scenarios around that, but bottom line is it's a comparison between the weight of that receiving uh, unit compared to the weight of the battery we're replacing. Uh, as well as perhaps the convenience and connection and, and connectivity that, that it's providing. Uh, on the systems that are out there, you know, for the, for the few kilowatt to, to tens of kilowatts, we're, we're kind of in hundred less than 100 pounds um, uh, for the weight on, on the receiver. For the megawatt charger, we're, we're probably in the you know, hundreds, or not probably, we are in the hundreds of pounds, um, but less than 1,000 pounds for sure. Um, and now we're looking at, you know, preferably re replacing you know, many thousands of pounds of, of battery uh, to really get this to a long haul scenario. Uh, so that, that's the comparison. Um, as far as the, the heat dissipation for a high efficiency system, you know, we can think about biasing the losses to, to one side or the other, but typically to get such high efficiencies, and here I'm looking at grid to, grid to battery with the numbers I was giving, kind of that 85 to 93% range, uh, that in, that, that's essentially comparable to the efficiencies of existing plug-in chargers. So a good portion of those losses are in the grid level, line frequency, AC to DC conversion, before we even get to the wireless charging uh, scenario. And then in the, in the final DC to DC management uh, of the battery on vehicle. So only a small portion, only a, a few percent uh, of that is actually in the wireless charging uh, unique uh, aspects of that AC to DC system from grid to, to battery. And to get such high efficiencies, we're, we're roughly equally splitting those losses between the vehicle and, and the inverter um, you know, included uh, in the roadway and in the pavement. Uh, distribution and management of those losses are, are a question. Typically on vehicle, we're, 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 we're really looking at low cost and, and simplicity. So whatever we can do to avoid requiring uh, a chiller on vehicle is where we're headed. So typically we do have some level of liquid cooling, but it's based on the radiator that's uh, already on the vehicle. That's how we manage the, the distribution. If possible, we'd like to get to purely passive cooling. And if there are those in the audience you know, thinking about this, that's really where I think the, the cost effectiveness of these systems is gonna come into play. If we can get rid of 
any type of uh, active pooling and management because that, that's both a reliability question and it's a cost. Roadway and pavements is also similarly a question. We have partners looking at lower power modules. You put multiple modules on the vehicle, let's say 20 kilowatts or less per module. Their motivation there is to have, again, all passive cooling uh, and limited uh, cycling of the temperature in the pavement. That, that impacts uh, reliability and lifetime of the pavement. Um, if we move to the high power, like our megawatt uh, stationary charger, you know, this is liquid cooling with chillers, no matter what, you know, it's a high power density within a square meter of, you know, having a megawatt power transfer, that's a real challenge. And, um, you know, that drives up the cooling and management. Um, you know, the real drive for efficiency is not, um, not necessarily the, the energy and, and emissions, because we're already significantly improved by going electric. It's all about the heat. You, you've, you've nailed that, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, so those are the key aspects of those two points from my perspective. Yeah. Xianghe, you have additional comment? Uh, uh, not too much. I think uh, from a technological point of view, it would seem like the, uh, uh, I think I agree with uh, what Regan has said that the heat uh, management, thermal management must be extremely important for these things. Uh, I'm just thinking from a more uh, physics side of the things, it would seem like significant part of it uh, come from the coil itself because uh, uh, basically, it's always the competition between delivering power to the load and then the parasitic loss, which mostly uh, on the electromagnetic side come from the coil itself. So that's where the heat generation is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in that regard, I think the uh, uh, thermal management is about, in fact, a fairly localized area and try to get those heat out uh, as much as you can. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, uh, as Reagan is saying, a megawatt system, even a 5% uh, loss, it's a significant amount of heat that's generated in that system. It's a gigantic heater sitting right there. But 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 also consider, you know, megawatt is necessary if you're going to do a, you know plug-in fast charging of these larger vehicles. And so yes, very similar challenge with a plug-in system. And and now yes. you're imagining, you know, who who's going to be out there plugging these cables? And and of course there is a standard, you know, progressing yes. for plug-in charging. Mm -hmm. It it will happen. But but boy, mm -hmm. there are challenges in cooling that cable for a plug-in mm -hmm. system. How much the yeah. same. This reminds me of a project in uh, Beats and Watts Initiative uh, faculty here. Professor Ken Goodson work on how to cool the cable. If you think about megawatt of power pumping into your electric car, a uh, fascinating problem. Well, back to you, Simona. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for Regan. It's a very technical question that is related to energy storage, actually battery. So you mentioned a few times during your talk that one of the advantage of wireless charging is to reduce battery size. And that leads to having a charge sustaining operation rather than the usual charge depleting operation that we've seen in electric vehicles. And uh, so that's a good news that we can reduce the amount of um, kilowatt hours we have to put on our vehicles. Now, one of the challenges when it comes to have a reduced size battery is the C rate. C rate goes higher, up. And with that, also the heat losses, right? And so I'm thinking about uh, uh, probably from an aging standpoint, the degradation standpoint, reducing size of the battery uh, might not be the best uh, things to have. And so if you're going that way, are you envisioning to replace battery pack uh, instead of eight to 10 years, like every three, four years? And what is the type of um, you know, degradation trajectory you're expecting to have in those batteries that are being charged through wireless charging? <laughs> Great questions. And, uh, and if we had all the answers to those, there wouldn't be a need for a research center here. <laughs> Give me your ideas. When uh, so that, that is, I mean, those are precisely the type of trade-offs. And, and there's a, a lot of complex, complexity, and, you, and you've highlighted many of them, and the interdependencies uh, of each of these. And that, that has a lot to do with what ultimately we'd resolve in this, in this broad simulator that, uh, that we're developing. Um, in general, there's clearly going to be a trade-off between the two. So as you've mentioned, if, if, we, if we continue down this path of very high range, you know, large battery packs on vehicles, the C rate when they're operating is relatively low because they're huge batteries. Um, but if you need to charge them very fast, not only are they a large battery, but they also have a, a high C rate. Uh, so that's a bit of a challenge for, for the large vehicles or large batteries. Um, so odds are we are not going to go to the other end of the extreme. So if we, if we go to the other end of the extreme of a very small battery, it means both we, you know, not only are we going to have higher C rates when charging that battery, but we're also going to have to have a, a lot of the infrastructure electrified, meaning that vehicle can't go very far off, off the electric road without running out of, uh, without running out of charge. 
So we see a hybrid here. It's probably going to be a, a mix here where we're going to have a portion of the infrastructure electrified, but vehicles are still going to have a reasonable range, um, you know, at least at the very least 30 miles, but probably 100 miles is a reasonable number to, to allow you to get to the vast majority of roads around the, the main arteries that, that would be primarily uh, electrified. Uh, in which case we still have a, a decently sized battery. And now it's a question of what portion of those roads are electrified and do you still need fast charging? That's gonna be a big question. If, if we get to the point where enough of the static and dynamic uh, wireless charging allows us to move away from fast charging, at least very often, uh, then if we have you know, half of the roadway covered or a third of the roadway uh, you know, covered or, or that portion of your time, you're, you're finding another charger. Uh, that means that uh, for a battery of 100 miles, and, and let's say you're, you're taking only you know, five or 10 miles when, before you get to another segment that's electrified, uh, the charging is probably still at, um, at C over two, C over three. Uh, you're relatively low C rates uh, for the wireless charging. The only time you're really gonna run into trouble is that you've got a vehicle, you're running on primarily electric roadways, but occasionally you go to a national park or some you know, off region, and you don't have that frequent charging available, but there's a high power charger that will get you charged up quick. That might mean that that same battery is going to have to be capable of a high C rate charging. Now, it may be that you only do that once a year or uh, you know, once uh, you know, per vacation. If that's the case, then the incremental degradation on the battery is probably acceptable. Um, so those will be some of the trade-offs that, that we'll be addressing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, have a, we have a question from the audience to Regan, actually. Um, so someone is asking if uh, you could provide some insight about to where the major cost of wireless power transfer technology come from. And what I would like to add also maintenance. How much does it cost to maintain uh, the type of infrastructure? Yeah. Long term. I know it's... <laughs> that's, still, uh, that's definitely part of our, our ongoing questions. And that's why you know, I showed some pictures and images of different scenarios we're considering with pavements with our civil engineering partners, as well as our, our infrastructure firm partners. That, these are, these are, are clearly the key questions, um, you know, maintenance and operation. It, it is critical these pavements are going to be long life. Uh, so there will be a significant component of, of design and implementation, similar to the way we design electronics for high temperature environments, for, for solar arrays. You know, these, these all need to be long life systems. Um, so we are targeting 20 plus year life electric systems. And of course, a small portion of those will still fail. Uh, and what is the maintenance and operation? We're envisioning concepts, including, for example, precast pavements in high density urban areas. You know, in these regions, you know, if we were to ever attempt to do the 710, which would take 20 years just to get approvals. Um, um, but, you know, in these regions, construction cost is probably the highest cost of the whole, the whole system. So anything we do has to be aligned with the maintenance and operation and schedule of those roadways. We're not going to go tear out a roadway just to add the electrification. We need to be on that maintenance schedule. When was that road needing, needing upgrade and, and maintenance in the first place? And we need to get in and out quick. And so for those regions, we're considering, for example, precast pavements that, you know, local precast yard would take the electronics. We would precast segments of lanes, and then those could come in on a truck and be dropped in maintenance could be on a schedule. Now, if, if we lose, you know, one mile might have, you know, three or 400 of these uh, charging lane or, you know, segments. Uh, if one goes out, we are integrating, you know, we have to build it up so that one failure doesn't take out the whole right run. So it's not, not like an old Christmas tree light <laughs> system, but uh, uh, it has to continue running. And, and if you lose one out of 300, you know, for the vehicle, it's no impact at all. Um, so the idea is, you know, there'll be some rate of, of failure of these units, but that won't take the whole system down. And now you would have a schedule on the one, three, five year where you come in, you pull that pavement and you drop in a new one. So that would be kind of a fast, easy, you know, maintenance operation schedule. But scenarios like this definitely have to be considered for, for a larger deployment. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Hey, back to you. I think we are wrapping up. Yeah, we need to wrap up. I mean, you, <laughs> you are working on fascinating topic, both yeah, of very you. Very fascinating. Uh, very yeah. new to me too, so I'm learning so much. And uh, as I learn, I have more questions. So, yeah, learn so much. Uh, I think we probably need to conclude today's panel. Uh, uh, Justin, can you put up the uh, holding slides? Um, I will be wrapping up today's uh, symposium. Let's see. Uh, Yeah, so to advertise our next two events for Storage X Symposium, uh, our own uh, Sally Benson and uh, on September 10th and also Dan Riker, they will be talking about 
a different aspect of uh, energy storage. Also a fascinating problem as well. I will encourage everybody to attend. Next slide. Um, and also uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we are very active, try to bring the whole community together and using our StorageX uh, in initiative uh, platform. And also we have our StorageX Tech Talks um, first Tuesdays of the month. So we have two very exciting speakers. That's the bottom left, uh, Tim Abate and Dean Dunn uh, to talk about their fascinating battery research. And also to advertise, Stanford has this uh, a professional education program uh, you know, with all this number of courses right there. And uh, this is, uh, we try to entertain a professional education for you to learn about energy uh, uh, broadly. With that, I will conclude today's symposium. Thank you, Xianghui and uh, Reagan, and thank you, Simona. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of fun.